This week I'm gonna do a thumbnail sketch of God's appointed times. Before I go into the appointed times, I'm gonna tell you about two books that have inadvertently maybe kind of sort of changed my life. And the first of the two books I wanna introduce you to is this one. Uh, Robert Weber's um, Ancient Future Worship. I'm going to read you the last sentence of the first paragraph because it basically encapsulates the whole book. And here's what Weber writes. Worship does, does God's story. And it's like, what in the world does that mean? Well, think about this. I'm going to make it short. We worship the Lord when we enter into those types of activities that glorify Jesus. Simple as that. And so what Weber does is he sets up this beautiful framework and then I think it falls short. What he does is he goes back to ancient practices or ancient liturgical practices and a lot of those are bound up or wrapped up in Roman Catholicism. And so I'm gonna say, eh, I don't think that's the way we should go. So let me uh, put a timeout on that book for just a moment and introduce you to another book by James Smith. This is called, You Are What You Love, The Spiritual Power of Habit. And what he does is he creates an incredible framework for uh, when we do certain practices, when we do that over and over again, this is essentially what we grow to love. And so the basic idea here is that uh, forms or practices are not empty conduits. Instead, they contain within themselves a particular telos, which means an, an end thing. So think about this for a moment. Who knows the end better than anybody? I'm gonna say that would be Yahweh. Not the church fathers, not those who came out of the ecumenical councils. I'm gonna say that Yahweh actually knew the end and so what he did was he gave us practices that we could Im Im immerse ourselves into where we could do God's story, where we could worship Jesus, worship God and yeah, there you go. And then we end up loving Yahweh even more through these particular practices. So um, I'm just like, wow. You know, I never really had a way to articulate why Yahweh's feast days were so cool or so awesome. And so I'm gonna just compare and contrast just for a moment. When I was growing up, I had these two elements of my liturgical year. I first had Resurrection Day and on this little rudimentary diagram, that was, a, that was a pretty big day, and Good Friday would be a little smaller, but that would be the day that Jesus died on the cross. And these two things are very important. Now, that got convoluted with a lot of Easter type things, but you know, it's just, I'm, here's what I don't wanna do, is I don't wanna do cheap shot right now. Let's just say you're a sincere believer, and you are celebrating Easter, and you are recognizing that Jesus rose from the dead, which is, exactly right and that's totally awesome but then you have a lot of people call them ce christians but really in the year it comes chris i mean easter first and then christmas and then so there's a christmas image and there it is jesus in a manger emmanuel god with us and that is incredibly important too but the narrative i wouldn't say is all that rich well as you might expect i'm going to give you what i think is a richer narrative and I think it allows me to worship Jesus a whole lot better. And I wanna show you what that is. So you can um, look in your Bibles if you want to. It's all in Leviticus chapter 23. But again, this is a thumbnail sketch. I'm not trying to be exhaustive here. I just want you to kind of get an initial framework into the, the path of righteousness that Yahweh has laid out for us. And so the first one uh, over there on your, on your left, I'm gonna just call this A. So what you're gonna see is A, B, C, D, and then you're gonna see uh, C prime, B prime, A prime. The only reason I'm doing that is not that this is necessarily what's called a chiastic structure, but because I'm looking at the Sabbath days, the days that we're to um, take off and, and rest in our Messiah, uh, if you look at that, what it does is it puts Yom Teruah or the day of shouting at the, at the very top or the apex, and that is Yeshua's re return. And you know, you might be thinking, well, no one knows the day or hour when Jesus is going to return. 
Well, that might be so, but at the same time, it's a common idiom that knew, no one knew the day or the hour of the new moon on that particular festival, so they would celebrate it over a two-day period, so no one knew the day or the hour. It's also known as Coronation Day. But anyway, on the uh, bottom left, you're going to see an A, and that in that A is going to be the it's the first day of unleavened bread. That is a Sabbath to the Lord. And the first event of the first day of unleavened bread is Passover. So that's where Jesus dies on the cross as the Passover lamb. And that, um, the, it's, it's unleavened bread because that is the day that we are to get all the yeast out of our homes, not eat it, not be around it. And the simple idea there is just because We've left Egypt doesn't mean Egypt has left us. And so we get the leaven out as a way to say, you know what? Even though Jesus has died on the cross for our sins, um, we need to uh, begin to walk in righteousness and we need to uh, par part ways with sin. And this is a process, a sanctification process. And then the next Sabbath day after that is the last day of unleavened bread. and. Best I can tell, uh, and uh, my community, um, I've got a guy in my life that's very knowledgeable about this, and I asked him about it, and the best anyone can tell is this is probably the day when everyone is right there at um, the, 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 the Red Sea, and Yahweh parted it, and they, you know, it's like this point of no return where they go through that Red Sea. Now, between those two days is not a rest day, but it is the uh, feast of first fruits, and that one would, would be when Jesus raises from the dead. Now, it's not a Sabbath day, and I would just conjecture that that's essentially a, a work day for the Lord. Now, I kind of, I think when I first started doing this, I thought, man, you would just think that the resurrection day would be like a, a, a bigger deal. But here's my speculative response to myself, and that is, you know, in my world, the anomaly is life is raising things from the dead. What's very, very common is death, but not so in Yahweh's world. For Yahweh, the anomaly is death. And so I would say that's why in Yahweh's, in Yahweh's um, narrative, when his son died on the cross, that was Passover, the, the, the day that we just like, woo, we just got to shut down. But first fruits was a day of work. And it is a big deal to me, and it is a big deal, don't get me wrong, but to God, He just makes life happen all the time. And so, you know, I just got to convince you that what I'm seeing is that is that uh, that is not quite as big a deal to Yahweh as it is to me. That's the best way I can describe it. But even so, the Feast of First Fruits is actually the first part or the first event and counting 50 days and that 50 is gonna become important in future videos when, you when we look at the, um, uh, uh, the Jubilee year. So there's 50 there, but now it's counting 50 up to the third Sabbath day, which would be Shavuot or Pentecost. So whereas Jesus is the first fruit, what happens is this other harvest happens on the 50th day, and it's essentially us being harvested. Now remember, Pentecost is another thing that we call it. Pentecost is when the Spirit was given. And so there's going to come a day in the future where the Torah is going to be completely written on our hearts and we're going to follow that Torah in spirit and in truth. And we're going to do it in perfection. We won't even need to be taught it. Now that's sometime that's going to happen in the future. But my point is, is that, that what gave us really a circumcised heart was the first fruit of our Messiah raising. We are, we are baptized, we are, we are buried with our Messiah, raised with our Messiah, and then the Spirit has given us that we might follow Jesus with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So that kind of caps, cap, encapsulates the spring feasts where uh, it's all about Jesus' first coming. And so then you've, there's this little gap, like three or four month gap, and then you go into the fall feast days. And I would just contend that the, really the apex here would be Yom Teruah, the day of uh, trumpets or the day of shouting, and it's Coronation Day. And in many ways, if you would think of Sinai as kind of a, a betrothal, where a betrothal contract, in a sense, was given to 
what would be the bride of Messiah, training her in righteousness, training her how to be a bride of Messiah, training her to um, walk in his narrative that in a way that exalts Jesus, right? So uh, the day of shouting is that apex, and then we, uh, we spot the new moon, and all that is is just kind of like this sign in the sky where we look forward to, to our Messiah's return. And then after that, we go into the day of atonement. So uh, this first day of the seventh month is called Tishri 1, and that is when you have... Uh, Yom Teruah, Day of Shouting, and then 10 days later, those are in Judaism called the Days of Awe. I'm not trying to be Jewish here, I'm trying to be Christian, I'm trying to live into the narrative of my Messiah and what he's done in our salvation sequence and then also our sanctifying sequence, right? So he's going to one day glorify us, he's going to, he's going to come back and get us, and I'm going to say that the Day of Atonement, you can look in Deuteronomy 22 here, but it talks about the virgin and the importance of like this virginity cloth and i would i would contend that at the day of atonement there's a national cleansing that's happen happening it also uh, in the scripture tells us it's supposed to be like this day of affliction where we fast and it's it's teshuva it's it's we are we are like really coming before our, our lord and it's like national repentance but there's this aspect of where the Apostle Paul says that he's going to, he wants to present us before Jesus as a pure virgin. This is kind of, I think, best I can tell where that happens. So you have the Messiah, you have the scapegoat. We'll go into the actual day another time, but you have the scapegoat, scapegoat but then our high priest goes into the Holy of Holies and presents us in a sense before the Father as a virgin. And yeah, there you go. And then five days later is, um, is the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles where Yahweh one day will tabernacle with us. Now, there's a, a past aspect to this too where we remember what was happening as, as we, ha we were in booths temporarily uh, during the Exodus. But then it also looks forward to the time where Yeshua, Jesus, will tabernacle with us and then finally is the last day of rest is the eighth day and that would be Shemini Atzeretz or um, and there's not a lot in the Bible said about it but it's the eighth day it is the um, best I can tell millennial kingdom the the seven thousandth year has come and gone and now a new beginning new heaven new earth and even when I get to that feast day, eventually in my video series, I won't be able to talk a lot about it because there's not a lot in the Bible about it, but it's going to come. But here's what I want you to see, is that this, in a sense, is a path of righteousness. Now, there's other things that we follow, spiritual practices that um, cause us to know Yahweh better. Um, press into his narrative that we might worship him, but this is a path of righteousness. And then I want you to see this final picture where King David in Psalm 23 says, you lead me in paths of righteousness, or the Hebrew word is actually, you lead me in cycles of righteousness. And this picture makes so much more sense to me that if I want to worship God, press into spiritual habits or spiritual narrative that exalts Jesus, so notice that every one of these are marked by a Sabbath day. It's not a bunch of doings. It's like, I'm running to this. I want to do it. I want to, I want to raise my hands and fall prostrate, prostrate before the Lord, but I also get to do something that the, ape, the, 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 the apex, the, the, the situation is that Yahweh wants us to stop and rest as a physical activity. So one of my friends loves to say this, you know, first in the natural, then the spiritual. In the natural, I'm gonna rest all day long, but it points to something that I'm resting in the finished work of my Messiah. And when I do these things, it's not that I'm trying to attain anything, it's just that I'm trying to worship Yahweh with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength and do things that specifically glorify my Father in heaven. I'll see you next week.